my friends and welcome to the last lecture of the frequency chapter. Today I'm going to cover sampling, the most fundamental block of signal processing which enables us to go from analog or continuous domain to the digital world. The first question is why do we need to go digital? Well, look around yourself. You can see a lot of digital devices such as cell phones, laptops, smart watches and so on. Digital signals are the fundamental element of every single computer and they have completely changed the world we live in. For example, back to old days for video editing, the editor needed to literally cut the film and tape the selected pieces together to create a movie. In digital domain, video editing is just a piece of cake using a special software enabled by digital signal processing. Or another example. Look at the mp3 player that you use to listen to music. You can have hundreds of thousands tracks on a single small device thanks to digital signals. You can copy and download new songs in a matter of seconds. Back to old days of gramophone, literally each giant disc was limited to one or few songs and not flexible. Last example, look at the 3D display with depth perception. This is just achievable thanks to digital TVs. Now let's see how we can go from continuous to discrete domain. Let's say we have this continuous signal XT. Also remember the impulse train from my last lecture on Fourier transform for periodic signals. As we learned, the Fourier transform of the impulse train is also an impulse train where omega naught is 2 pi divided by t. Let's call the impulse train in the time domain PT. Just for the sake of notation and consistency with the signal processing books, I'm going to replace capital T by TS and omega naught by omega S. S stands for sampling. So TS is usually referred to as sampling time and omega S is called sampling rate or sampling frequency. The first and most critical step to make our continuous signal XT discrete is to multiply it by the impulse train or P of T. Zero multiplied by this part, we get zero. The amplitude for all the impulses is one. So one multiplied by this point, we get one non-zero sample here. Then this zero part is multiplied by this and we get zero. Also 1 multiplied by this point, we get another non-zero sample. Again, this part is multiplied by 0 and we get 0. Here's another non-zero sample and so on and so forth. The distance between non-zero samples is Ts. Let's call this signal S of T. ST is basically a sampled version of XT. And Ts dictates the distance between the samples. When we decrease the sampling time Ts, based on this equation, sampling frequency omega s will increase as there is an inverse relation between time and frequency domain. In this case, as Ts is smaller, non-zero samples are closer to each other. This means we sample faster and we end up with more samples. On the other hand, when we increase the sampling time, based on this equation, the sampling frequency decreases. In this case, as Ts is larger, the distance between non-zero samples is higher. This means we sample the continuous signal slower and we end up with less samples. There is always a trade-off between quality and memory storage. In the first case, the quality is higher as you have more samples and the sampled signal is a better representation of the continuous signal but you need more memory to store all these samples. On the other hand, in the second case, the quality is lower as you have a sparse representation of the continuous signal, but you need less memory to store non-zero samples. So far, we learned in order to make continuous signal XT discrete, the first step is to multiply it by PT, or the impulse train. This gives us a sampled version of XT which we call ST. In fact, we are replacing XT by its samples when we go from continuous to discrete domain. Now here is the golden question that forms the foundation of everything in digital signal processing. Can we recover the continuous signal, i.e. XT, 
from its samples, i.e. st. Or if st is given, can we go back to xt? Well, the answer all depends on the sampling rate or sampling frequency. So here is a better way to ask the golden question. What is the lowest sampling rate so we can still recover the continuous signal xt from its samples? You might ask why are we interested in the lowest omega s? Think about it, because we want to store as minimum samples as possible to save memory. At the same time, we don't want to lose any critical information. The answer to the golden question is called Nyquist rate. Let's find out what is the Nyquist rate. Imagine you have this continuous signal xt. As was mentioned, to make the signal discrete, we need to multiply it by the impulse train where TS controls the distance between samples. ST is the sampled version of XT. Again, remember the golden question. What is the lowest sampling rate so we can recover XT from its samples? ST is simply XT multiplied by PT. From my lecture on Fourier transform tables, we know multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. Don't forget about 1 divided by 2 pi. From my last lecture on Fourier transform for periodic signals, we know the Fourier transform of an impulse train is this impulse train. Let's replace this expression here. Here's what we get. 2 pi is cancelled by 2 pi. As we've seen many many times in the past lectures, to do convolution with a shifted delta function, we just need to shift x omega. If you don't know why, please watch my lecture on the convolution examples. Now let's convolve x omega with this delta function. Here's what we get. You just need to shift omega by k omega s. This is s omega or Fourier transform of the sampled signal. Let's fully understand what this means by expanding the sigma. We have a lot of infinite terms plus when k is minus 2, plus when k is minus 1, plus when k is 0, plus when k is 1, plus when k is 2, and so on. This simply means s omega is equal to x omega plus shifted versions of x omega. And the whole thing is scaled by 1 over ts. To answer the golden question, let's say the Fourier transform of xt is like this, where omega m is the maximum frequency in x omega. st is the sampled version of xt. The Fourier transform of st, i.e. s omega, is x omega plus shifted version of x omega by omega s to the right. So 0 goes to omega s, omega m goes to omega m plus omega s, and minus omega m goes to minus omega m plus omega s. If you don't know how to shift a signal, please watch my lecture on signal transformations. We have another copy of x omega, which is shifted by omega s to the left. So 0 goes to minus omega s, and here is what we get plus other infinite copies shifted to the right and left. Don't forget about the scaling factor. This is s omega, the Fourier transform of the sampled signal. The question is, can we recover xt from its samples? The answer is yes, if and only if there is no overlap between x omega and the other copies. To satisfy no overlap condition, this critical point must be greater or equal to this point. So, minus omega max plus omega s must be greater or equal to omega max. If you bring this term to the other side, this simply means omega s or sampling rate must be greater than 2 omega max. This is the answer to the golden question and it's called Nyquist rate. If the sampling rate omega s satisfies this condition, we can recover xt from its sampled version st. To do so, all we need is to convolve st with a low-pass filter ht 
with this frequency response. As we need to compensate for 1 divided by Ts, the constant value inside the passband area must be Ts. This is our frequency response. If you have no idea what this means, please watch my lecture on the frequency response. Convolution between ST and HT means multiplication in the frequency domain. So this part is multiplied by this constant and will be passed. Please note the amplitude goes back to 1 again. This copy is multiplied by 0. This copy is multiplied by 0. Also, all the other copies are multiplied by 0 and get rejected. So, if you compare these two, we can clearly say they are equal. This means we just recovered xt from its samples as the Nyquist rate was satisfied. Now let's see what's going to happen if the Nyquist rate is violated. Let's plot s omega again. s omega is x omega plus the shifted versions. In this case, because the Nyquist rate is not satisfied, there is an overlap between the neighboring copies. This overlap is usually referred to as aliasing. Due to the aliasing, S omega becomes like this if you add up all the copies. This part is distorted and the information here is gone gone. If you use the filter again, you get something like this which is not equal to X omega and you can see the aliasing here. So remember, to avoid aliasing, you must satisfy Nyquist rate. Done. Let's quickly recap the whole story. Imagine there is an old music company which stores all the songs as analog files. To catch up with the technology, they decided to go digital. So the first step to make a continuous signal discrete is to multiply each analog signal with an impulse train. Because of this multiplication, in the frequency domain, we get the spectrum for the original signal plus infinite copies shifted to the left and right. The distance between neighboring copies is controlled by the sampling rate. If the sampling rate is very high, the distance is high. But this means we have so many samples to store and the file size becomes large. So, we need a lot of memory to store data in this scenario. If we decrease omega s or sampling rate, the distance between the copies becomes less. Based on the Nyquist rate, to avoid overlap between neighboring copies, there is a lower limit for the sampling rate, i.e. 2 omega max. If omega s is set to 2 omega max, these points overlap. At this point, we can't decrease the sampling rate anymore as we get aliasing. So, if the Nyquist rate is not satisfied, there is an overlap between the copies and the signal gets distorted. This is called aliasing. Done. You might ask, what is the practical implication of aliasing? Well, aliasing can result into a noisy signal or some weird effects. Let me show you a real example when the Nyquist rate is not satisfied. Imagine you are filming a scene with your camera. In video processing, sampling rate is usually called frame rate. Sampling rate basically means how many samples we take per second. So in video processing, this means how many frames we take per second. Each frame is a two-dimensional image of the scene. If we play frames back to back, we will basically have a video. Now imagine this car is moving forward, so the wheels are rotating in this direction. There is a red dot on each wheel. Let's assume the sampling rate is very fast which basically means the time distance between frames is very short. Remember, there is an inverse relation between sampling rate and sampling time. When we sample fast, in the first frame, the red dot is here. In the next frame, the dot is here. In the next frame, the dot moves to here, and so on and so forth. So, as you follow the dot in different frames, you got the impression that the car is moving forward. Now let's assume the sampling rate is very slow, which basically means the time distance between frames is very long. 
Let's say in the first frame the dot is here. By the time we take the next sample, the dot actually travels all the way to here. So in the second frame, the dot appears here. Again, by the time that we take the next frame, the dot moves all the way to here. So if you follow the dot on the consecutive frames, you will get this illusion that the car wheel is moving backward. However, the car is actually moving forward. This is commonly called reverse rotation effect and happened due to aliasing. Now let's solve some examples. First example, what is the minimum sampling rate to sample an audible sound? Well, as you may know, human beings can usually hear sound between 20 and 20,000 Hertz. So this is the maximum frequency. To avoid aliasing, the sampling rate must be at least 2 omega max, which is 40,000. Nyquist rate is the reason why common file formats like MP3 or WAVE use around 44,000 Hz as a sampling rate. To be safe, the sampling rate in these formats is slightly higher than 2 omega max. Next example. What is the minimum sampling rate to sample 1 over pi multiplied by sinc t cosine t? Based on the Nyquist rate, the minimum sampling rate is 2 omega max. To answer this question, we need to find maximum frequency in this signal. So we need to travel to the frequency domain. As we learned in my lecture on Fourier transform tables, the Fourier transform of this sinc function is rect omega divided by 2. Rect stands for rectangular function. Just to refresh your memory, rect omega is 1 between minus half and half. To find rect omega divided by 2, based on my lecture on signal transformations, we just need to expand the signal by a factor of 2. So minus half goes to minus 1, and half goes to 1. Also, based on the table of pairs, we know the Fourier transform of cosine function is summation of two delta functions. xt is basically this function multiplied by this function. As we learned in the table of properties, multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. So here is the Fourier transform of xt. Don't forget 1 over 2 pi from the property. Pi is cancelled by pi. Remember, to convolve a signal with a shifted delta function, you just need to shift the signal. So when you convolve the rectangular window by this delta function, you just need to shift the window by one unit to the right. Minus 1 goes to 0 and 1 goes to 2. Here we go. Plus convolving this window by this delta function. To do this convolution, we just need to shift the window by one unit to the left. So minus 1 goes to minus 2 and 1 goes to 0. Here we go. Don't forget about this constant. This is basically the Fourier transform of this signal in the time domain. If you add up two windows, you basically get this signal, which is 1 from minus 2 to 2, multiplied by half, so the amplitude is half. This is the Fourier transform of this signal. Remember the question again, what is the minimum sampling rate? Based on the Nyquist rate, Ws must be at least 2 omega max. The maximum frequency is 2 here. So the minimum sampling rate is 4. Next example, xt is multiplied by this impulse train where the distance between samples is 1. The signal here is called st which goes through this filter. The output is called yt. This filter is low pass with this impulse response. The amplitude between minus pi and pi is 1. For the first part, the question is to find s omega in terms of x omega. This is very simple. st is basically xt multiplied by this impulse train where the sampling time is 1. The Fourier transform of xt is x omega. As we learned, the Fourier transform of the impulse train is again an impulse train. Sampling time is 1. So the sampling frequency is 2 pi divided by ts, which is 2 pi. Let me replace ts by 1 here, and omega s by 2 pi. Also ts here is 1, so we get 2 pi. 
st is xt multiplied by the impulse train. The multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. Don't forget 1 over 2 pi. 2 pi is cancelled by 2 pi. Again, remember this property. So, when you convolve x omega with this delta function, you just need to shift omega by k2 pi. Here we go. This is s omega, the Fourier transform of this signal. Done. In the second part, you are asked to plot s omega and y omega if x omega is like this a triangular function between minus pi and pi. To plot s omega, let's expand the sigma. Here's the expansion over the k. So s omega is x omega plus x omega shifted by 2 pi to the right. So minus pi goes to pi and pi goes to 3 pi plus x omega shifted by 2 pi to the left. So pi goes to minus pi and minus pi goes to minus 3 pi. This is s omega. In the next step, we are asked to find y omega, which is the Fourier transform of yt, the output of the filter. yt is st convolved with ht. If we go to the frequency domain, convolution becomes multiplication. s omega multiplied by h omega. Let me plot h omega here again. To find y omega, we simply need to multiply s omega by h omega. So this part will be multiplied by 1 and passed. This copy is multiplied by 0 and therefore rejected. The same story for this copy. And the other copies, they are all rejected by the filter. So here is y omega. Done. In the last part, you are asked to plot s omega and y omega if x omega is this triangular function between minus 2 pi and 2 pi. Again, s omega is x omega plus x omega shifted by 2 pi to the right, so minus 2 pi goes to 0 and 2 pi goes to 4 pi. Here we go. There is a huge overlap here plus x omega shifted by 2 pi to the left, so 2 pi goes to 0 and minus 2 pi goes to minus 4 pi, here we go, plus other copies. As you can see, there is 50% overlap between neighboring copies. So if you add up this line with this line, you get a constant value of 1. Similarly, if you add up this line with this, you get 1. The same story for the rest of the signal. So here is the summation. This is s omega. To find y omega, we need to multiply s omega by h omega. h omega is given. If you do the multiplication, this part is multiplied by 1 and will be passed. This part is multiplied by 0 and gets rejected. The same story for the rest of s omega. So the output is 1 from minus pi to pi. Done. What is the main takeaway from this example? Let's look at part B and C again. In part B, the maximum frequency was pi and the sampling rate was 2 pi. Therefore, the Nyquist rate was satisfied. That's why y omega was equal to x omega or basically we were able to recover xt from its samples. In part C, the maximum frequency for the input signal is 2 pi and the sampling rate is again 2 pi. So the Nyquist rate is violated. In this case, if you compare y omega with x omega, you can easily see they are not equal because of aliasing. Done, done. Okay, that's all you need to know about the Nyquist rate. Thank you very much for watching this video. Now you can call yourself a sampling expert. This was the last lecture of the frequency chapter and I just want to say many many thanks for your amazing feedback and comments. You are the best of the best. The next chapter is on Laplace transform and we're gonna have tons of fun together. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and see you in the next video. Cheers!